Tuesday, October 12. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. New vaccination policies are to be announced soon. Prime Minister Andrew Honis says the new policies are to be implemented after the government completes its public education campaign. He was speaking during a tour of vaccination blitz sites in North Central Clarendon. So we still have a little way to go to perfect even though we can't really perfect the process, but to do the process as best as we can of reasoning with our people, giving them the information, addressing their concerns. And I think that as soon as that process is done, which can go on past the end of this month, because we have been doing this from last month, so we have been taking our time moving around, that we will have to then move and announce a policy as to how we come out of COVID. He noted that societies with a similar constitutional basis as Jamaica have implemented measures to differentiate between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. After approximately 10 months of virtual meetings, members of Jamaica's cabinet held their first in-person meeting on Monday. Cabinet members presented their COVID-19 vaccination cards for inspection by protocol staff at the office of the Prime Minister as part of the protocol for the return to face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, there is no replacement for being in the room, seeing your colleagues uh, directly and in person, and it certainly helps to make better decisions. Whilst on online facilities are useful, they simply cannot replace the effectiveness of meeting in person. Member of Parliament for Kingston Central Donovan Williams says investors are at the table to foot the bill for housing developments in his constituency, but crime and violence continues to be a challenge. He spoke during last week's constituency debate in Parliament. Real estate investors, Madam Speaker, yes. have also expressed serious interest yes. in constructing housing solutions in central Kingston. And I am pleased to report that suitable lands have been identified and earmarked. Yes. The discussions and the, the negotiations are in its early stages, but they are very promising. the construction of vertical housing units in a gated environment setting with the beautiful Kingston Harbour and Palisades, providing the background for a picturesque and breathtaking view. Mr. Williams says the constituency is currently experiencing a spate of murders. Namely, the Kingston Central and Kingston Eastern Police Divisions. For the year 2021, up to September 30, the sections of the constituency which fall in the Kingston Central Division, namely Tel Aviv, Southside, Almontown, and Rose Gardens, have recorded 46 murders. Madam Speaker, sections of the Franklin Town, Ray Town, and Southside community fall within the Kingston Eastern Police Division. And up to September 30, Eight murders were recorded compared to 11 murders for the corresponding period of 2020. Five shootings were recorded since January 2021 to date, compared to seven shootings for the corresponding period in 2020. Therefore, on the eastern side, Madam Speaker, we have made marginal improvements. I want to publicly, co publicly commend the hardworking members of both divisions, led respectively by Superintendent Beresford Williams, Kingston Central, and Superintendent Tommy Lee Chambers, Kingston Eastern, for their unwavering commitment to uphold law and order in the constituency. In, re in, rec in recent weeks, the police have stepped up their operations in these troubled communities by setting up buffers and conducting joint police-military operations. It is worth noting that this is happening in a national ethos, Madam Speaker, where policing these volatile communities is becoming more challenging. Meanwhile, Member of Parliament for St. Andrew West Rural, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, says a community park, partly funded by the Tourism Enhancement Fund, is to be established in Golden Valley in her constituency. 
Mrs. Cuthbert Flynn shared the news while contributing to the ongoing constituency debate in Parliament. The space is being used as dumping site for old cars and garbage and it's unsightly because it's right across from the primary school. A community park can be of great mental health reliever, providing a safe space for relaxation for families and safe play area for children. So this part, Madam Speaker, will have a walking path for exercise, a play area for the children, barbecue pit for family gatherings. The second phase of the of, will see the football field being upgraded with gold nets and a better surface. I will combine my funding from the Constituency Development Fund with funds from the TEF for this financial year. This will be a safe space for our children and family for physical activity and entertainment. The Golden Valley community will have a new look once this is completed. She says the plans are in place to develop Lawrence Tavern as well. I want to thank the Honorable Desmond McKenzie and his State Minister, Homer Davis, for the initiative to develop five town squares to the tune of $600 million. Well, Madam Speaker, I have chosen Lawrence Tavern Square as one of the squares to be developed this financial year. Minister Omar Davis and along with my councillor John Myers and I toured the area and work should begin this financial year. For your information, the State of the Constituency debate allows members of Parliament to share highlights of their performance in their constituencies and also drum up support from the Ministry of Finance to implement projects. The latest James Bond film, No Time to Die, premiered locally on Friday and features scenes shot in Portland and Kingston, Jamaica. The movie's soundtrack features reggae and dancehall singles from Shaggy. Sister Nancy and Buja Banton, as well as Noah Poa, Teacher D and Jabuz. Culture and Entertainment Minister Olivia Grange is applauding Jamaica's representation in the film. The film's new Bond girl, Lashana Lynch, is of Jamaican heritage and it also features an appearance by Jamaican actress Naomi Harris. We get the latest financial market updates in this quick business report with Gabriel Thompson. In foreign exchange trading for Monday, October 11, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $150.75. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $119.84. The pound sterling traded for $204.70 and the euro sold for an average $175.19. In Monday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,411 points to close at over 409,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 98 stocks of which 39 advanced, 46 declined and 13 traded firm. The junior market index declined by 22 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Berger Paints Jamaica Limited, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. Stocks declined for 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Trading firm were CAC 2000 9.5% Preference Shares, Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, and Epley Caribbean Property Fund Limited SCC. Lumber Depot Limited was the volume leader with over 3 million units, followed by Fontana Limited with over 2.3 million units, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 1.4 million units. In markets, data for oil prices rose towards $80 a barrel on Tuesday within sight of a three-year high, supported by a rebound in global demand that is contributing to energy shortages in big economies such as China. Brent crude futures added $0.17 cents to $83.82 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures gained $0.08 cents to $80.60 a barrel. And on that note, we close this Tuesday edition of the Business Report inside the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Pleasant viewing.
Over to news from the region. In Barbados, the government is to receive 7,000 single-dose shots from the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine from Guyana today. More details from Barbados today. Word of this from Prime Minister Mia Motley, who also revealed that another 14,000 Pfizer doses are still to be delivered to the island after being purchased through the COVAX facility. Addressing the nation yesterday from Ilaro Court, the Prime Minister further disclosed that close to 60% of persons eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccines have been given at least one dose. She said based on information from health officials, the weekly vaccination rates have been progressing at a steady rate, with almost all of those who received the first dose returning for the second. We have to recognize that the class of persons to whom a vaccination can be given are those 12 and over. 142,543 have taken it. My friends, that is almost 60% of the eligible Barbadians who have taken it. Because once you have taken that first shot, you've already made up your mind to go along that route. And Major Clark and Dr. Ferdinand have advised me that virtually 99% of the persons who have come for a first job come back for their second job. That tells you that Barbadians are serious about this thing and they're making sure that they comply wherever possible. It is in that regard that I'm happy to report that if we can continue at this level, believe you me, we will make it. But we equally have to recognize that we took a decision that we weren't going to mandate. And why? Because mandating means that I have to tell you, or we have to tell you, that somebody needs to put something in your body. We accept that. That is difficult, especially for adults. And we've said that we're not going there with adults. Declaring that government fully respected the choice of some Barbadians to choose not to get vaccinated, the Prime Minister said her administration's duty was to encourage all citizens to get protected as a matter of importance. But by the same token, I also have to remind you that we have a duty also to those people who do not want that thing which is in your body, which may be a virus, coming out to contaminate or infect them too. And therefore, there has to be a balance with respect to the duty of care that we have to all Barbadians. Let us be very clear that the lockdown, we know, does not and did not and will not work well. And in fact, there's a lot of mental fatigue, not just in Barbados, but across the world. The Prime Minister of Norway, Ernest Solberg, has indicated that. There are a number of other countries that have also indicated that the mental fatigue after 19, 20 months is making it difficult. We believe that in spite of that, that we have a duty to create a safe place and a safe zone. And that is why we feel that at this stage, we now have to take fresh guard and to look at what is possible. Despite a recent decrease in confirmed coronavirus cases in the Bahamas, the former Minister of Health says drastic restrictions need to be considered as hospitalizations remain overwhelmed and COVID deaths are continuing at an unprecedented rate. Health authorities say the Delta variant is not the most dominant strain in the country. Dr. Dwayne Sands says drastic restrictions need to be considered as hospitals remain overwhelmed and COVID deaths are continuing at an unprecedented rate. We just have to be mindful that we continue to be uh, troubled by excessive levels of COVID in the Bahamas, and particularly uh, a massive uh, level of deaths from COVID uh, as the healthcare system is badly overwhelmed. Dr. Sands says anyone who believes that the Bahamas is winning the war against COVID is dead wrong. He adds that as crazy as it may sound, he believes that the Davis administration should think seriously about drastically increasing restrictions in a bid to make the Bahamas as COVID-free as possible. So we are watching people die left, right and center. Uh, so it becomes extremely important for us to um, get it in our heads that um, it's not going to be business as usual anytime soon.
The Bahamas has been struggling with an unprecedented surge in COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths in its third wave. However, within a day of being elected, Prime Minister Philip Davis relaxed curfews on multiple islands, including New Providence, moving all of them to midnight. Since then, COVID cases have not increased, though positivity rates still remain high. Well, the Delta variant is now the most dominant strain of COVID-19 in the Bahamas. According to the Pan American Health Organization, COVID-19 incident manager Dr. Sylvian Aldegheri, who says that labs in South America have linked the variant to the cause of recent infections in the Bahamas. The most recent samples uh, sequenced at the Gorgas Institute in Panama and at the uh, Fiocruz Foundation in Brazil through the Power Genomic Surveillance Network, this uh, sequencing have demonstrated 50% 50, 50 of Delta, 45% of Alpha, and only 1.3% of Gamma. According to Aldegheri, people may be testing or rates of vaccination are on the rise. Either way, experts believe that people are becoming more relaxed. Although Delta is becoming predominant in most of the countries of the Caribbean. And in this context, it is important to remember that this process of displacement and replacement of strains or variants is an expected phenomenon which has been happening since very early in the pandemic and occurs among other factors because of a circulation of viruses that like the Delta variant are better adapted to the human host as part of their evolution process. In lighter news, with COVID-19 vaccination cards and their IDs in hand, patrons made their way to the various safe zone locations in Port of Spain as businesses in the entertainment and food sectors reopened for in-house dining. One customer told TTT News she visited her gym for a spin class before attending a celebratory lunch with her husband. So I did go and do a spin class this morning. It was great. So that really got me going today. So when I got home, I said, let's go and have, have a date today, you know, which we are here now. For Nova Bustick and her husband Kurt, the Safe Zone initiative was a welcome change after months without outdoor recreation. They were among the people who visited bars, restaurants, even cinemas on Monday as places reopened for those who are fully vaccinated. Restaurant fine dining manager at Jenny's on the Boulevard, Faraz Hussain, said the company is observing all protocols under the initiative. You have to be fully vaccinated and you have to have a form of ID and you have to walk with those those are information and if you are not you will not be allowed inside on the premises over at movie town a 63 year old self-proclaimed movie buff was the first to enter the port of spain branch to see the movie free guy i've been to the cinema since about almost 50 years and i do enjoy cinema and i believe the cinemas offer much more than a uh, pirate copy or seeing something that is not quality or visible on a small screen Marketing manager at Movie Town, Dion Williams, said the company is excited to welcome back their customers with open arms, revealing which movies are most in demand. There's a lot of a lot of engagement on our socials with respect to Bond. Um, after Bond, there have been there's been a lot of interest in Venom, um, and Shan, she's picking up some some momentum as well. She said the latest showtime is at 6 p.m., giving patrons ample time to make it home before the 10 p.m. curfew. Establishments within the safe zone must operate at 50% capacity. Kimberly D'Souza, TTT News. As we look to sports, we kick off with football. Jamaica's reggae boys will face Honduras in another crucial World Cup qualifier on Wednesday. The squad arrived on Monday afternoon, but minus two players. Philadelphia Union wingback Alvas Powell is now sidelined after picking up a grade one tear of his left hamstring, while AFC Burnmouth forward Jamal Lowe returned home in keeping with the terms of an agreement for him to be available for just two games with Jamaica. The squad has been reduced to 19 players as Damon Lowe returns following his one-game suspension. The boys are at the bottom of the group standings with two points, with Honduras just ahead on three points. 
And in other sporting news, cricket coach Winston Spencer will be conferred with a badge of honor for Marita's service on National Heroes Day, October 18, during the virtual National Honors and Awards Ceremony. Spencer coached the St. Jago High School cricket team for 46 years and will be lauded for his contributions to the development of the sport. Among the talent nurtured by the now-retired coach was Danza Hyatt, Tony Powell, Gregory Brown, Robert Harley, Steve Wint, Rudolph Nelson, and Wayne Murray. Some of these players went on to represent Jamaica and the West Indies. West Indies does not have a consistent success in bilateral T20 international series, but come World T20 events, they have proven to be a consistent force, winning two of the latest three World T20 tournaments. Head coach Phil Simmons, speaking at a virtual press conference on Monday, said he is banking on the rich history they have in tournaments to help them over the line. He also commented on the injuries of noted players Andre Russell and Nicholas Peran. We get more from Newsroom Guyana. With the IPL going on, we see that Russell not playing today. This must be a concern for you um, with his injury coming into the World Cup. No, not, not really. We, we've been in constant contact between our medical and, and, and KKR's medical. And he, he's been batting in the nets. He's been running at a certain level. So he's close enough to fitness. Um, there was a talk um, out. I don't know if it was on just on social media, but he might have been up to play today as a batsman. But they've they've gone against that, and and we we'll see how we move forward. But he's been progressing really well. Are you concerned about the form of some of your players, your vice captain more specifically, Nicholas Peron, who's been struggling for form right through the CPL and into the IPL? Going into the tournament, which starts, as you said, in about 10 days, of course, the Western will start their defense on the 23rd. And mm -hmm. while I'm asking that, are you, can you divulge what role do you see Chris Gale playing in this setup once the World Cup begins? Well, the thing about it is that once we sit down and, and we, um, we look at things, it, it's a case where I'm not, I'm not too worried about Nicholas. I, I think Nicholas has been batting well. I think in, in, in CPL, he played well. There's a lot of pressure on him there. Um, there's going to be more pressure here. But I think that he is working hard enough. He's, he's doing all what he has to do. And sometimes it doesn't come off, but it will come off. So I'm not worried about him. Chris, we have... Um, specific roles that we are going to that we've put on Chris and and we trust that he is going to make, be ready and inform and everything having had a, a a short rest from the game and from the bubble he's going to come back fresh and ready to do and, and produce what we ask him to do and that's all we have for you today join us tomorrow same time same place as we bring you more news and sports right here on PBCJ the people's station